Good afternoon. I have no statement. I have nothing to read, and you'll find out if I have anything to say by asking me questions. So, Charlie, good afternoon. I, it's rare that I beat you here, but today I did. Yes. Is it true that the White House volunteered uh, to talk, uh, as uh, they said in the uh, to Lockheed, as they said in the statement yesterday on the Peters memo? The um, first of all, the, the secretary has signed today a memorandum in which he accepts um, uh, Mr. Peters' proposal to recuse himself from being involved in any contracting issues involving the Sacramento Air Logistics Center. And that means that the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition and Management, uh, Darlene Drulian, will serve the purpose of the, of, uh, the, fill the role of being the Chief Acquisitions Officer. In addition, the Secretary plans to uh, appoint the um, Actually, it'll be the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisitions and Technology, and the Deputy Secretary will appoint uh, independent advisors to uh, monitor and assist in source selection to make sure that it's uh, done in a manner that is consistent with the uh, request for proposals. We, you can get a copy of this memorandum if you'd like after the briefing. I think the there are two important points to make about the situation, and that is that nothing in the memo represented a change of policy. The policy of this administration and of this building is uh, competition between public and private uh, bidders for work, and the memo was designed to produce that type of competition. And uh, second, uh, to the best of my knowledge, no one spoke to Lockheed uh, about whether it was going to become a bidder for work at the Sacramento Air Logistics Center. Yes. Uh, Secretary, aware of the Army uh, problem with this new uh, truck? The Secretary um, read your story uh, in the early bird yesterday and uh, is aware of it. I'm not sure that he was aware of it previously, but he's aware of it now. The question is whether they're going to go ahead and buy 9,000 more of these trucks before this problem is sorted out. Well, that's uh, primarily a decision for the Army to make because the Army is the contracting authority here. It, it, Secretary Cohen does not survey this contract. Um, this is a contract that's handled, handled at the Army level. But it my understanding. the Army. It was uh, uh, under Gantzler's uh, acquisition uh, authority. Uh, for this contract. This uh, is a major uh, $15 billion contract. I, I do believe the Army, and what the Army told me was that um, uh, that the chief contracting authority is, the, uh, is an Army officer here. But I think the point to focus on is what's being done about the problem. And my understanding is that uh, since the Army discovered the problem late last year, uh, they have done some surveys. They have placed um, operating restrictions on approximately 4,200 trucks as they check them out to find out um, if they share a common problem, which they believe is a drivetrain problem. Uh, they have so far have found about 100 trucks that have this problem. My understanding is that the contractor has devised a method for fixing, the, identifying and fixing the problem and the contractor will do that at its, uh, at its own expense. So that is now underway. Uh, I, don't, I cannot answer the question about what's going to happen with the rest of the contract. I think that's something that the Army and the contract will have to work out. Clearly, the Army doesn't want to buy uh, more trucks that are subject to the same drivetrain problems that seems to affect some of the trucks um, in the initial uh, amount they've purchased. Some of these trucks uh, have tipped over uh, without uh, the uh, drive shaft problem. Some some officers are concerned it may have too high a center of gravity. How many? 
I had trouble finding out one how many uh, rollovers have occurred uh, with this new truck since it was fielded, and two, how many troops have been injured by it? Uh, well, that's something that you would be better off querying, querying, querying the Army about. Uh, my understanding is that they have uh, found uh, three uh, rollovers that they attribute to drive shaft problems, and that uh, uh, there were no fatalities uh, in those uh, in those rollovers. In fact, I think all drivers were uninjured in the rollovers uh, in those three cases. But the Army would have uh, would have better figures. I saw you used a figure of 12 in your story, so I assumed that that was a, a figure that came from some uh, reliable well, database. Varied, but there, there was no central source for accumulating how many rollovers this truck has been involved in, just, just from the sheer height of the truck. It's, uh, it's, my, it's my understanding that the Army is, uh, is the best source of information on this, and uh, I'm sure that they'll be glad to give you this information. Yes? Could you tell me why you're seeking a, a waiver to the Leahy uh, moratorium on anti-personnel lines? Or sure. Go a little bit beyond the text of the letter to Thurmond. Yeah. Um, the issue is a moratorium on the use of anti-personnel landmines that is supposed to take place on uh, February 12, 1999, and last for one year. This was included in a piece of uh, legislation that was passed several years ago. The administration is asking Congress um, to be uh, relieved of this uh, moratorium. And uh, what the uh, administration has said, uh, and the military feels very strongly that this is the case, that this um, moratorium will uh, damage the ability of the military to carry out operations and to protect troops. Uh, as you know, last year, when the uh, President decided not to sign the Ottawa Agreement, he based this decision on the need to protect the safety of American troops. It was really a force protection decision, and also to uh, allow our troops to carry out their military operations in the most efficient way. We now use uh, self-destructing anti-personnel landmines that uh, do not pose a lingering threat uh, years after the battle is over. These mines um, explode in a matter of hours or days after the battle is over, so they don't, they don't remain hidden in the ground. At the time the President announced this decision last year, he said that um, we needed uh, adequate uh, transition period to seek out alternatives to anti-personnel landmines. And he promised that we would uh, stop using anti-personnel landmines by 2003 in everywhere but Korea and in 2006 in Korea. Obviously, a moratorium that takes place for one year, beginning on February 12, 1999, runs contrary to the idea of giving the military time to transition away from anti-personnel landmines to some alternative. It's the military's feeling, and they express this in the letter that you referred to, the letter from Secretary Cohen and General Shelton to the Senate Armed Services Committee, that uh, the moratorium would dramatically limit our ability to fight and win battles in places such as Korea. As you know, there is an exception in this moratorium for international borders and in clearly identified uh, demilitarized zones, such as the DMZ between North and South Korea. But that DMZ is only four uh, kilometers wide. And this policy, if it were to take effect, on February 12th would make it impossible for the military, the American military, to use anti-personnel landmines between the DMZ and Seoul, for instance, if Seoul were under attack. Now there's an alternative to anti-personnel landmines, and that is to, to use greater forces, to deploy more forces very quickly in the early stages of battle. If we were to do that in Korea, we would have to deploy 17,000 additional troops, 350 additional tanks, 410 additional Bradley fighting vehicles, 24 additional helicopters, and 144 other aircraft. 
So it would mean, mean a very substantial increase in our forces in a very short period of time because we assume that in Korea our warning would be very, very uh, short. When you look at specific examples like that, and the military has analyzed many of them, it's concluded that um, at a time when our forces are being drawn down, our forces are now 36 percent smaller than they were at the end of the Cold War, at a time when our forces are operating in a more expeditionary manner, um, deploying from the United States to places like the Gulf or Bosnia, um, and uh, continuing our deployments to Korea, that it w is an unacceptable risk to endure this moratorium next year. So they are asking Congress not to require them to move forward with the moratorium. You, you spoke about a transition period and looking for alternatives. Can you, uh, can you say what sort of uh, movement you're making in the uh, search for alternatives? Well, there's a, a, a program um, uh, underway, is, and, but it's based on the President's determination that we have until 2003 to eliminate APLs everywhere but Korea, and 2006 in Korea. So it's a program that uh, is, a, is a five to ten year program, five to eight year program. But um, some of the things we're looking at are, uh, are barrier devices of certain sorts. Um, we're looking at uh, certain uh, monitoring arrangements that uh, might uh, substitute along with artillery or other means for, um, for anti-personnel landmines. But we do not have a, uh, a uh, firm substitute at this stage. And our program is based on the idea that we have several years to develop one. Does that include the Claymore? Was that part of the? I don't mine? know. I don't know specifically um, which which mines are well, it's covered on the surface. It's used increasingly in, as an assault, but it's designated as a mine. The um, the main concern here is that um, if there were an attack in a place like Korea, or if. Uh, Iraq were again to attack uh, Kuwait or Saudi Arabia, one of its neighbors, and we were uh, went in to defend that the type of mines that we have to deploy with artillery or through aircraft uh, to channel the battle, uh, particularly in the early stages of battle, or to protect our own troops, uh, that would be forbidden to us. And uh, at a time when our forces are getting smaller, uh, it, the Joint Chiefs have decided that this is just an unacceptable risk. So we are talking to Congress, writing to members of Congress, uh, and appealing to them in other ways to uh, give us a relief from this moratorium. Yes? If, if Congress doesn't go along, are you saying then that that list of, of, of people and material that you just read off is then going to be shipped to Korea? No, I didn't say that. What I'm well, saying is that to illustrate what would be required to replace the use of uh, anti-personnel landmines in our war plans, um, it, it's that level of commitment of additional people and equipment. But um, I'm not prepared to say right now that we would immediately have to increase our troop levels in Korea by 50 percent. That's 17,000 would be approximately a 50 percent increase in our troops level there. Well, I think that um, it's something that the military would have to consider. It would have to um, relook at a number of its battle plans to make sure that they, um, one, protected our troops as much as possible, and two, uh, uh, were as, uh, as efficient as they are now. Yes. Uh, Marcus Oak from BBC TV. Um, there are reports from London today that the Pentagon was caught trying to hack into the computer files of a British based dolphin conservation charity. Um, can you comment on those reports, what branch of the U.S. military is involved and why they might be doing that? It's the, uh, it's the first I've heard that we're trying to uh, use our computers to tap the brains of dolphins. But um, I will look into it. Can I just follow up on sure. that? Sure. I mean, as I understand it, this is a charity doing research into military use of dolphins, and they claim that... Uh, this is the first I've heard of it, sir, and I'll just have to uh, find out what I can and get back to you. If you talk to Colonel Bridges here at the end of the briefing, we'll get back to you. Yes, Jamie. Um, Following this briefing, we're scheduled to get a briefing from some senior defense officials on the subject of readiness. Can you just tell us, just generally, are we going to hear that readiness is, uh, is, is better than we think or, or worse than we think? 
Well, I think I should leave them to describe what you're going to hear, but um, in very brief terms, you'll hear that um, uh, Secretary Cohen and uh, General Shelton and the Joint Chiefs are concerned about readiness. Um, they believe that the first to fight forces are highly ready and um, uh, prepared to go uh, when and where they have to go, and that um, uh, the uh, that maintaining readiness throughout the force is a challenge, but it's a challenge that is being uh, addressed aggressively by the services today, and the key to being able to maintain readiness is congressional action on um, several pieces of legislation, a program reprogramming for uh, money in the final quarter of 1998, fiscal 1998, as well as um, uh, work on the 1999 uh, defense budget and a supplemental for Bosnia in 1999. So are, are these briefings um, a not so subtle attempt to, uh, to, to influence Congress or to make the case uh, to Congress? Or? These briefings are a bold attempt to educate the press about readiness. Yes. <laughs> I, think the, I think the Secretary said, uh, maybe last time we saw him or whatever, that, that the 1st of May was, was the, the date at which things would start, uh, cutting shortfalls would start actually cutting into operations and training. Has there been any such Well, that was based on, uh, on, a, uh, uh, on a failure to pass the supplemental. Uh, for fiscal 1998, and Congress did pass that, for which we're very grateful. So those plans uh, have been set aside because the supplemental was passed. There are basically four things that have to happen and the, the, to, maintain, um, uh, to maintain fiscal readiness and military readiness, and one was passage of the supplemental. Yes? Why is this background, uh, this briefing on background is coming up on readiness? I mean, what's so it's, secretive this is about more readiness that they can't discuss it openly? There's nothing secretive about readiness. That's why we're giving you a briefing. Well, then why not on record? Why, why on background? Well, I read in newspaper and wire service stories all the time, anonymous people talking. <laughs> so we thought we would help you. <laughs> why? Again, again, why not, why not on the record? This is, I mean, it's a, it, this is more of an education than anything else. And uh, it just seemed to us that the easiest way to do it was on background. Is this, is this about new metrics to measure readiness that you're thinking about adopting? Uh, no, we have adopted some, uh, some uh, metrics in the past, and that may be discussed. One of the issues uh, with readiness has been to um, make sure that we have an accurate way of assessing readiness and making sure that, um, that what we hear anecdotally is reported to us from the field in actuality. Yes, Suzanne. Uh, back to the, uh, my original question on the memo. Uh, why is it necessary for Mr. Peters to accuse himself? Well, I'm not sure that, uh, um, uh, that in an absolute sense it's necessary because he's as committed to competition, to free and open competition between public and private bidders as everybody else. But certainly from a political standpoint, it, um, I think is, is uh, makes uh, Mr. Petersfeld, it made some sense for him to do this, to remove himself as a, as a target of criticism here, and also to remove any question about the bidding process. Does the secretary, uh, has the Secretary heard complaints that, that uh, the gentleman ought to basically be fired in <coughs> Capitol Hill? Has he well, received I, phone calls? I think calls he's or read he... the same AP story you've read. Um, mm -hmm. Right. And his reaction? What well, does he think? Does his, he his reaction is that, um, uh, that the, Mr. Peters has suggested a, a, a fine way to deal with this, with this uh, issue, and that's well, recusal. Because, because he Mr. Peters did anything wrong? I think that um, what we want to focus on now is, the, is resolving this problem and going ahead. The, obviously, this has been awkward for everybody involved. And uh, what he's certain about is that this administration, this building under his direction, is committed to free and open competition for work at the depots. What about, could you comment on the sort of the larger charge that's been leveled by members of Congress, that the administration is, is, uh, is playing politics with the base closing process and therefore undermining the, uh, the so supposedly independent nature of this process and, and poisoning the well for future base closings. What's at issue here 
is maintaining the administration's policy and the policy of, of Congress for full and open competition for work at the depots. And uh, I think that uh, the action today uh, makes it very clear that we're determined to do that. Um, one of the things the Secretary is going to do is have the Deputy Secretary and the Undersecretary for Acquisitions and Technology set up an independent review authority to look at the bidding process. Yes? You know, the Pentagon's policy has been privatization. It's, it, it hasn't been privatization in place now for some time. That memo talks very specifically uh, not just about setting up a competition, but encouraging Lockheed uh, to keep the business in Sacramento. Talks about this other option that, Sacra that uh, Lockheed might have in South Carolina, and goes on at length about what would be necessary to, um, to get Lockheed not only to bid, but to, if it won, do the work on the KC-135 in Sacramento. The fact of the matter is that a process is going to be set up to make sure that this bidding is uh, handled in the uh, fairest possible way and that the contract is let in a squeaky clean way, and I'm confident that, that will happen. What Ernie. What say about good faith when the Pentagon has to set up a process to stop White House meddling in the whole, whole um, issue? It says that, uh, well, first of all, I don't accept the premise of that question. I think it's a mischievous premise and wrong. Um, and beyond that, I think what it says is that we're determined to make sure that this process uh, is totally transparent and that people have faith in it. Yes? Another topic? Sure. Well, just one, uh, cool. could you detail what this independent review authority is going well, to be again? Well, it hasn't, it'll be some, you know, like somebody who might have run the GAO at one time uh, it'll be some uh, uh, person who's skilled in government contracting procedures and uh, accounting techniques, et cetera, uh, who, and it may be more than one person, but uh, that person will just um, uh, uh, will be independent of the department and will review the source selection process to make sure that it's conducted appropriately. And the reason we're doing this is to eliminate um, uh, some of the fears that have arisen that this process won't be handled fairly. Yes. Ken, uh, the new Defense Minister of India, George Fernandez, has uh, declared publicly that China is the, the India's potential, potential threat number one and further said India should awaken to the fact that Chinese military activities and alliances, notably those involving Pakistan, Burma, and Tibet, have begun to encircle India. He also cited the fact that there were new airfields being built in Tibet by the Chinese, that they have stored nuclear weapons there, uh, and, and they, there's a listing post on an island uh, uh, apparently out of the Indian Ocean. Um, I think that's uh, called uh, Cocos, the Cocos Islands. Uh, what is the view of the Department of Defense of, uh, of Mr. Fernandez's uh, particular uh, warning? Uh, about the uh, Chinese, and is he accurate, and in, in what are you citing? Well, uh, I don't want to get into um, uh, commenting on India's views of its uh, defensive challenges. I will say that this administration has made it very clear that an arms race on the Indian subcontinent is destabilizing in that area and, uh, and could have much broader dangers. And we urge um, all countries in that uh, in that uh, very heavily populated area to avoid arms races. That's been our policy, and it remains our policy. Is there an arms race in progress on the part of the Chinese? Um, uh, as I said, I'm not going to comment on India's views of its uh, of its of the threat threats it may face. Yes, Suzanne. Can you tell us anything about the uh, where the uh, uh, Pentagon IG's investigation is involving uh, General Hale. In the I Army. can tell you that it is in process. Is it anywhere near being completed, as some reports have said? Um, I suppose it depends on your view of complete, but I would say that it's um, at least uh, uh, several weeks away from being completed. At least. 
Just yes. Uh, can, uh, has there been any, has the uh, secretary made a recommendation yet on the troops in the, in the Gulf? Uh, um, well, any recommendation he's made would be made to the president and would be private. Has, so there's, has there been a decision yet? The administration is in the process of, uh, of discussing that issue, but there's been no decision made yet. You say, has a recommendation gone to the White House? Um, we're in the process of discussing that issue, and no decision has been made by the administration. And on the tomb, has he made a decision on that? He has not. He has the report. Hasn't read it yet. Hasn't been briefed on it. But that will come relatively soon. Cuba. Cuba. Cuba report will be out this week. What day? <laughs> um, not today. Um, just to clarify on the uh, um, IG investigation and the general the situation, General Hale. Do I understand it correctly that that investigation will look at whether or not the Army made the correct decision in allowing him to retire uh, while the investigation, while he was being investigated? Is that one of the things that uh, will be looked at in that investigation? Uh, the subject of the investigation is General Hale. It's not the Army. And um, I don't want to go further than that. I think I'd just like to wait for the report to come out. I have not um, followed the details of that investigation or the report, um, which isn't finished yet, very closely. Didn't the secretary say that the general counsel was going to look into that? The that general separate counsel part is, of how, is, how is going to look at that as well. Are they, they have not completed their look at that? Well, I think they'll wait for the IG to complete its work. Yes, Paul. Uh, has the Pentagon's consultations on the tomb issue uh, found uh, any resistance uh, to the idea, either from organized groups or uh, families? I th my impression, and I haven't sat in all the, uh, the uh, consultations, but my impression from talking to people who have uh, met with veteran service organizations, with uh, members of Congress and their staffs, and with the families is that uh, most people appreciate the balance that the Pentagon is trying to strike here between protecting the sanctity of the Tomb of the Unknowns on the one hand and, uh, and uh, f full accounting for those uh, uh, killed in action on the other hand. And um, I think everybody appreciates that DNA testing gives us a tool today that we haven't had in the past and certainly didn't have in 1972 when, um, uh, uh, when uh, uh, Lieutenant Blassie's plane was shot down and others were shot down uh, over or near on lock. And we didn't have in 1984 either when uh, these particular remains were put in the Tomb of the Unknowns. Uh, it's not my impression that there's been a lot of opposition to the idea that, uh, that um, has been recommended by the staff, which is that uh, the remains be taken out and, and examined with new DNA testing techniques. Have you had any, um, any objections from any of the uh, family uh, the matriarchal line of the nine? Well, I haven't uh, spoken to uh, every member of the families. I've read uh, probably the same accounts that you have. Um, I think there are, are different degrees of, of uh, commitment to this process but I don't think anybody is steadfastly against it. Yeah. And we take very seriously the views of the families, and we have been talking to the families, but um, uh, my sense is that they understand what we're doing. Yes? Have you had a chance to look at the uh, GAO's report of uh, April 30th, I guess, on the uh, year 2000 uh, problem in the military? Not, not in any detail. I mean, we, we believe that we're, uh, I think the GAO report reflects some old information. We think we're, uh, in, we're moving forward um, on schedule. Uh, and uh, I'd be glad to have somebody come down and give you a, uh, a briefing on the year 2000 issue and what we're doing to deal with it. Yes. Uh, I guess the uh, Italian Prime Minister is visiting uh, tomorrow, and I'm just wondering if the um, if the damage that was done to U.S.-Italian relations by the uh, by the accident, Marine jet accident, uh, is it your estimation that that damage has been repaired, or what, how would you characterize the state of uh, whether that? Well, 
it, it clearly was a, a, a terrible tragedy. We've apologized um, uh, to the Italian government. We've apologized to the families of the deceased. We have uh, made uh, some payments to the families of the deceased uh, to cover burial and other costs. I think the Italians are impressed by the seriousness with which we have taken this accident, the thoroughness of the investigation that took place in Italy, and uh, now the uh, thoroughness of the legal proceeding that's taking place here um, concerning the crew of the plane. Yes? One other question. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Can I ask one more question about the platoon? Sure. Um, you mentioned the recent advances in DNA testing uh, that were not available when the Vietnam remains were interred. Um, is it outside the realm of possibility that perhaps the World War II or Korea remains could be identified through these new DNA techniques? I, I, that's, so that's a good question, which I can't answer. And um, uh, one of the things we plan to do is get somebody down here from the uh, Armed Forces uh, DNA Identification Laboratory to talk about the procedures um, if the secretary makes a decision to exhume. And at that time, I think you could ask him or her that question. Good. Yes, I'd like to wrap this up because we do have the, uh, what, what, the next briefing what, team ready. Are you aware of any increased um, smuggling by Iraq of uh, oil out of Iraq for sale in violation of, uh, of, of UN sanctions? Um, I guess the answer to that question is increased compared to what? Um, recent weeks or months. Well, that's exactly the right uh, frame of reference in weeks or months. Uh, starting in, uh, in early January, there was a dramatic decline in the amount of oil smuggled um, out of Iraq. Uh, it went, um, it fell by approximately 90 percent. So from the level at the beginning of January to, say, um, late January, early February, there was a 90 percent reduction. Um, that low level of smuggling uh, continued um, uh, through March and, uh, and April until about the last week of April when the smuggling began to increase. It has gone up. Um, uh, somewhat, but it's still probably uh, less than a third of what it was at its peak in late December or early January. So the question is why is this happening? One, why was there such a rapid decline in the amount of oil being smuggled out? And two, why is it now going up? There are a couple of reasons. One is that the uh, one reason why it declined is that we have become more aggressive in enforcing the embargo, our maritime interdiction force has become more aggressive in its activities. There are two or three destroyers devoted to this um, on an average day. Uh, but I think the main reason is that uh, Iran became less, um, uh, less receptive to the smugglers. Um, the smugglers have been sort of skirting the shore of Iran, uh, working sometimes hand in glove with Iranian uh, uh, naval uh, units, and uh, that stopped in uh, in early to mid January. Uh, Iran became hostile to the smugglers. Uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks, we've seen an increase in the smuggling volumes. They're still far below the peak, but they have gone up two or three times from the low points in March and April, and it appears to be happening because Iran may be less vigilant. Uh, in controlling the smugglers now than it was, say, in March or early April. We don't have a, a good explanation for why that's the case. Yes? A quick uh, Linda Tripp update. Uh, has she produced any work product lately? Uh, and where, what is the status of that investigation into the release of her Privacy Act? Um, the investigation continues. Um, uh, she is spending uh, a lot of her time uh, dealing with the independent counsel, but she has been doing some uh, work on her project. I don't believe she's submitted anything concrete, but uh, she is in touch through email with, um, with her supervisor. Yes. And for the second day, fighting is raging in, in Kosovo, and the, uh, the, the Albanian foreign minister, Pascal Milo, has warned that, uh, that uh, that full-scale war could erupt in Kosovo, and, and the uh, Albanians are closing the border as best they can. Have you any comments on, on these reports? 
Well, the contract contact group is working very hard uh, to apply diplomatic pressure against uh, primarily the Serbian side to um, uh, show restraint, but we've also made it very clear to the uh, 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 the Kosovar uh, uh, side as well that they should show restraint. We think that diplomacy is the way to avoid dangerous fighting here, and that's what we're we're working for. Thank you. We'll be back in five minutes.